peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning. And on this St. John's Day, we always begin our morning with these words, Quam Delecta. Our service uh, continues in the leaflet with the invitatory and psalter, Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him. Let's say together the Jubilate, which is the text of Psalm 100. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. Let us read together, alternately by verse, Psalm 84. Quam delecta. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has found her a house and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young. By the side of your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. Happy are the people whose strength is in you whose hearts are set on the pilgrim's way. Those who go through the desolate valley will find it a place of springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. They will climb from height to height, and the God of gods will reveal himself in Zion. Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Hearken, O God of Jacob. Behold our defender, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For one day in your courts is better than a thousand in my own room, and to stand at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord is both sun and shield. He will give grace and glory. No good thing will the Lord withhold from those who walk with integrity. O Lord of hosts, happy are they who put their trust in you. Glory, glory to, to the, the Father, Father, and to the, the Son, and to, and the, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was, it was in, in the beginning. beginning is now, now and will, and will be, be forever. forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Job. Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in this house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Keziah, the third Karen Hapuch. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived for 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of days. The word of the Lord.
seated for our reading. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The word of the Lord. Take my lips, O Lord, and speak through them. Take our minds, O Lord, and think through them. Take our hearts, O Lord, and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. Quam delecta. Quam delecta. All of my life, I've had a friend, almost all of my life, all of my life, save about 11 years, I had a friend whose name is Pete. And I've known Pete since he was about eight and I was about 11. And all of his life, Pete has been deaf in one of his ears. And I don't remember if it was an injury or a birth defect, but his whole life, uh, one of his ears, he has not had any hearing. And a few years ago, uh, Pete had a surgery that restored the hearing in his ear. I feel like it was a cochlear implant surgery, so those of you who know more about hearing will know whether it was a loss or if it was a birth deficit. But Pete went, I remember, to have the device turned on, and he brought with him his sister, Brooke, and she filmed the event. So that as he was in the clinician's study, when the device was turned on and he heard binaurally in stereo for the first time, either in his life or in many years, we all got to see his reaction. Of course, you know, he was amazed as the sound came into his ears, his eyes opened widely and he started crying. Uh, he was just overwhelmed and they shared this video on Facebook, which was a gift to us all. Before he uh, had his hearing restored, he played the guitar. But after he had his hearing restored, he played the guitar really well. Before he, play, he had his hearing restored, he sang. But now he sings much better, in fact, more confidently. He's louder, more confident, more musical, more intelligible, and even more religious. Being healed has made him so incredibly thankful. And that little video he shared on Facebook gave me such insight into the story of this blind man receiving his sight. It made that story so much more immediate and it grounded it in reality. It made the story of Bartimaeus even more profound. Now, I don't know that I've shared this, and maybe I have, but I have been blind in my left eye since I was born. And I have a small sort of collection of companions who, like me, are blind in one eye. They include my adult friend, Larry, who's blind in his right eye, and my college friend, Sarah, who's also blind in her right eye. I'm left. So we joke that when we get together, we make one totally blind person <laughs> or one fully sighted person, depending on our mood. 
Now, as a child, I always wondered how my life would be different if I could see fully. Now, over time, I've gotten more and more comfortable with my limited vision as it is. Now that I'm an adult, I'm no longer forced to play sports that require or are aided by binocular vision, like tennis, lacrosse, softball, soccer, or baseball. I'm no longer ridiculed for my limited ability at these sports, given that I do not have, and never have had, natural perception of depth or distance. And now that I'm an adult, I've kind of mastered some strategies and habits to be safe and effective in a world of three dimensions. I recognize that I need to pay more attention to distance while driving and moving around unfamiliar spaces. Now, I run into fewer corners as I round them. Not none, but fewer. And I try to brake less aggressively in traffic. But even now, at my advancing age, I still pray, not that Jesus might restore my sight, but rather that Jesus might change the way I see. I pray that Jesus might give me the vision to see the world as God sees it, to help me look at the world with wonder and love, not criticism and critique, which is perhaps my normal habit. I pray that God might help me be moved to joy and compassion, not frustration and annoyance. It's become very common to appreciate that for many reasons, you and I are living in increasingly narrow spaces in our public and private lives, spaces that reaffirm the way we see the world. A lot of writing has shared with us how hyper-partisan spaces reduce the world to winning and losing, to politics of division, not community. But I wonder, and I know this sounds naive, but I wonder, what could be different if we actually tried to expand our perspectives? What would be different if we all took the opportunity to change the inputs in our lives? Would it change our perspective? Now, I have been criticized in the past in my, for my preaching for not being specific enough. So, here are some recommendations. Maybe you and I can read more poetry and less opinion. That might make us more open to wonder. Maybe you and I could all stand to listen to more music rather than talk radio. That might make us more open to joy rather than critique. Maybe you and I could stand to read more fantasy and less satire. That might give us an expansive view of what is possible rather than a critical view of what already is. Maybe there is a way, if we change what we consume in our lives, that God could show us all that we already are and that we, all, all that we already are and all that we can do and be together rather than succumbing to our natural tendency to see all the challenges that we face, and all that we are missing or need to be to be who we want to be. Perhaps with renewed and restored vision, when we seek to appreciate the challenges in our lives, we can look to all the assets that we have to accomplish our life and God's mission instead of focusing on all that we lack, all that we don't have. Maybe with renewed vision we will see with God the way the world is abundantly shaped, abundantly beautiful, abundantly fruitful, rather than focusing on how little we have. Maybe we will finally see all that we have to give away, not all that is owed to us. Now, in the midst of the pandemic, with bad news and scarcity all around, I tried to make it a practice to ground myself in gratitude 
rather than expectation. I tried to make my prayers prayers of thanksgiving rather than petitions for more. I tried to ground myself in prayer for the possibility of God's kingdom rather than the limited view of the world as it is and the destructive habits of partisanship and division. Now, it didn't change the world, but it shaped the way I saw the world and it made me a little bit more hopeful. It kept me a little bit more grounded. Maybe it kept me a little bit more sane, but maybe not. <laughs> maybe we could all stand to share God's view of the world a little bit more. Maybe we could try, all try, to renew our vision with God's continual help. About 19 years ago, Sarah and I had the chance to travel together to Europe. It was our last European trip. We need to schedule, you know, another one. Uh, and on that trip, we traveled to Amsterdam. And one of our excursions while we were in Amsterdam was to visit the Van Gogh Museum. Standing in front of Van Gogh's paintings, paintings I knew well from books and art classes, standing in front of them, though, changed the way I saw his art. The colors were deeper and more vivid than I ever could have imagined. They shone with a luminosity and depth that photographs never captured. It was like transformative and mind expanding. Yesterday, Sarah and I took the family to see the immersive Van Gogh exhibit that our fellow parishioner James Sana has produced. It's the one on Vesey Street, not the uptown one. Just to note, there are two immersive Van Gogh experiences. The Vesey Street one is the one we went to. That exhibit includes a virtual reality experience and an amazing space that allows you to be surrounded on all sides by the intense beauty of Van Gogh's art. And it gave all of us who were visiting the opportunity to almost be inside his paintings. Like my visit to the Van Gogh Museum years before, this experience really changed the way I understood his art. It was almost as if I was able to be inside Van Gogh's head to see the world through his eyes. The depth of beauty, the presence of his pain, all were there. We weren't just looking at the paintings from a distance. Instead, we were inside them. We inhabited that world. Following Jesus in community is meant to invite us, like that experience, all to enter into Jesus' world. It's not simply enough to know about Jesus. God's invitation to, to believers is to be like Jesus, to do the work of Jesus, to see with the eyes of Jesus, to love with the heart of Jesus, to act with the hands of Jesus, to embrace strangers rather than exclude them, to love generously instead of only those who are most like us, to be redeemed agents of healing rather than sinners demanding perfection from God and from the world. That's real discipleship, to live with baptized eyes, to love with baptized hearts, to act with baptized hands. What would that be like? Stephen Charleston is a bishop in the Episcopal Church and a friend of mine, and he uh, is an indigenous person. He writes daily reflections on Facebook. If you aren't following him, maybe take a minute, find Stephen Charleston, you'll enjoy the, re the reflections. He writes with a particular perspective that comes from his experience as both a bishop and an indigenous person. And yesterday, he wrote this amazing reflection, which I thought was apropos. He wrote, how thin the walls between earth and heaven, how close the space between us, a blink, a look away. In an instant, the gap is closed, the two realities flowing together like rivers passing in the moonlight. If you are still enough in your soul, you can hear the footsteps of your ancestors just a breath away. 
We are not isolated in a mechanical clock universe for no rhyme or reason, but fellow citizens of a creation alive with purpose, animated by love, drawing time forward to disappear in a timeless grace. He concludes, on a clear day, you can see the angels flying. On this beautiful and clear St. John's Day, I believe that God is extending to us a renewed invitation to cleanse our vision, to deepen our discipleship. Perhaps it's not enough to just like Jesus. Maybe we should also strive to see like Jesus. Maybe we can learn to be like Jesus. Maybe we can try to love like Jesus. Then we might see the world with renewed eyes. We might love the world with renewed hearts. We might engage the world with expanded spirits. And then we might really know how to follow him. What a generous invitation that is. Quam delecta. Amen. And now, standing as you are able, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, let us affirm our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory, the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Show us your mercy, O Lord. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. Let your way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. As we continue to pray, I invite you to either stand, sit, or kneel as you, are, as you prefer. And I ask your prayers for this church on its anniversary celebration. Gracious Father, we pray for thy holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth, in all truth, with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. 
I ask your prayers for the church throughout the world. O God, who has made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and did send their blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near, grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through the same, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I ask your prayers of thanksgiving today for the birth on Friday of Magnus Raycroft Ali to Elizabeth Thompson Ali and Gamal Ali. I ask your prayers for our parish family. Almighty and most merciful God, we remember before you all poor and neglected persons whom it would be easy for us to forget, the homeless and the destitute, the old and the sick, and all who have none to care for them. Help us to heal those who are broken in body or spirit and to turn their sorrow into joy. Grant this, Father, for the love of your Son, who for our sake became poor, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I ask your prayers for all those who are sick and those commended to our prayers. God of compassion, be close to those who are ill, afraid, or in isolation, particularly those serving our nation overseas, our partner school and church, St. Matthias and Dayland, Haiti, the nation of Afghanistan and all those seeking safety for their families there, and all those who are adversely affected by the coronavirus and its response, and for all those who are ill, Eileen Bellini, Chloe Clancy, Jimmy Cleary, Elisa Dean, Luke Demarest, Nancy Fowler, Barbara Gallagher, Bob Gonzale, Vanessa Gullo, George Harstead, Carol Jamison Hildebrand, Evelyn Hiller, Edith Hoffman, Barbara Keats, Ruth Knudsen, Marie Lee, Edward Martinez, Virginia Martinez, Una McHugh, Alan Moore, Peter Morris, Peter Powelko, Joan Penrose Borum, Luna Bell Perone, Raphael Roper, Jack Santaniello, Joan Small, Connie, and any others we name now aloud or in our hearts. In their loneliness be their consolation, in their anxiety be their hope, in their darkness be their light. Through him who suffered alone on the cross but reigns with you in glory, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I ask your prayers for all those who have died. In particular, David Bigelow, Leon Balaki, Shirley Baker, Doug May, and Margaret Cuthbert Broadus, John Gregory Riley, Carol Spear Riley, George N. Lindsay, and Mary Dickey Lindsay, in whose memory the altar flowers are given this morning to the glory of God. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed by the mercy of God rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. And we say together, we give you thanks, most gracious God for the beauty of earth and sky and sea, for the richness of mountains, plains, and rivers, for the songs of birds and the loveliness of flowers. We praise you for these good gifts and pray that we may safeguard them for our posterity. Grant that we may continue to grow in our grateful enjoyment of your abundant creation to the honor and glory of your name now and forever. O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord.
Please be seated. A warm welcome to you all on this festive day. Uh, we have it all going on. Just wait one second, you're going to see. It's like the whole place is going to explode into incredible music. But between now and then, I have a few announcements. Uh, the first uh, are just some pastoral announcements. Um, We've been sending a lot of pastoral notes uh, lately through our email, um, and so you'd be forgiven if you missed some of them. But we announced last week in church uh, that Leon Balaki, who is the father of Joanne Murphy and father-in-law to Blake Murphy, passed away a week ago Friday. His service is tomorrow at 10 a.m. here at the church. We had not gotten the chance to announce that a longtime parishioner and centenarian, Shirley Baker, uh, passed away last Monday. Um, Shirley's service will be this week on Friday. Um, details will be forthcoming in a special email that goes out, but I believe that service is at 10 a.m. also. Uh, but don't hold me to that. It could be 11, just sometimes 10 and 11 get complicated in my head. Um, and many will have heard um, and heard us pray for our dear friend, Doug May. Uh, Doug May uh, passed away yet, uh, on Friday afternoon um, at St. Francis Hospital after a short and intense uh, cardiac issue um, following an earlier cardiac issue some years ago. We don't yet know of the plans uh, for the service honoring Doug's life. Uh, we're speaking with the family about all that. As those plans uh, come together, we will share the news with you um, as soon as we have it, but we ask you to keep Doug, his wife, and their daughter Liz in your prayers as they go through this complicated time. Uh, let's see, a few other announcements and uh, then we'll get to the, you guys need help finding your parents? I know some Fowlers, here's some Fowlers. We got, is that a salmon under that mask? Over here, just back there, I see your mom waving. Mr. Kim. Not yet, almost. Okay. Where, where are they going to go? Oh, with their parents. Okay, yes, sorry. I was like, I didn't, another ring. So I've got uh, Charles back there. I've got some Grecos, some Grecos over there. I've got, so Ella, your dad's back there. Sophia, your mom's over there. Maeve, I don't, up there? Oh, great, up there in the balcony. And Bird, you know, they're right there. Okay. You can sit with me if you need. All right, a couple of other announcements. Um, yes, today, St. John's Day, marks the end of our formal stewardship campaign. It doesn't mean that we've wrapped up all our calls, but we're going to stop asking you on Sundays uh, to support St. John's. To all those of you who have brought your pledge cards today, we invite you to put them in the offering basket. They can come up with the offering. And for those of you who have already submitted uh, commitments to support St. John's, we say thank you. To all those who are still praying about their gift to St. John's, we thank you for considering seriously supporting us in the future. Um, and we're so honored by uh, the many, many gifts of support we have received. Um, and we, as I said, will stop uh, asking on Sunday, but I think vestry members are still calling. So uh, keep an eye out for those unknown numbers, uh, for those calls of thanks uh, from members of our vestry. If you have any questions about what your gifts of support do and how they're put to use here at St. John's, Billy Rush, our treasurer, is actually holding the offering plate right now. Uh, could not be more appropriate, but you can ask Billy after church um, as we have our St. John's Day celebration uh, on the Bluestone patio behind, um, behind the church. There are special cakes and some offerings, some treats from our hospitality committee, um, and we uh, hope that you'll join us for that. Additionally, uh, just another announcement that this week our study, How Then Shall We Live, is on a pause. Um, we're taking a little break. Uh, but we'll return a week from Wednesday looking at uh, two issues, social media from a perspective of the Christian faith, fascinating, and also ecumenism, which is the church's efforts uh, towards unity uh, that have been uh, up, coming up uh, increasing over the 20th century in particular. So two topics a week from Wednesday. If you haven't had a chance to read the book, there's still time to get it. It's available as an e-book. Um, and feel free to consider joining us um, on any topic you find of interest. Uh, let's see, you're standing here, did you, yes, do you have an announcement? Yes, I have a, I have a couple of announcements. The first um, is that this coming Saturday is going to be a banner day um, for a couple of things. One, um, it will be the day in which we are planting garlic. 
Um, so if you have not been down to the garden before, this is like our kind of like big last event. So at 10 a.m. next Saturday, we have garlic planting. So if you want to come down to the Grow to Give garden, uh, we would welcome you there. The second is, is that um, next Saturday is our, you know, multi-youth annual uh, spooky walk um, at the St. John Cemetery. Um, and we are really excited to be, we have a new path, very exciting. Um, and so we invite all families to come in costume and anyone that is interested in helping to make it spooky, um, a person of any age um, should reach out to me and we have some, some roles for people that want to be, help be on the team. Um, the other thing is, is I have two announcements about today. Um, the first is that we are, um, as we do every year, packing boxes um, for folks that are away at college and at boarding school. Um, so if you'd like to help uh, Ms. Vicki um, and Tori with the packing of the boxes, we'd be grateful to have a few extra hands. They're gonna be set up in Bleecker Hall um, and we send folks who are away from St. John's a button and a bulletin from St. John's Day. Our kids upstairs made them backpack tags um, and there'll also be a bunch of edible treats. So we welcome a few extra hands in preparing that. And then finally, today is our first day of confirmation class and confirmation class will be beginning um, around 11.15. So go and have a few snacks and then we'll meet in Bleecker Hall. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth. You're welcome. Thank you. June, do you have anything other than the obvious? Uh, what's the obvious? The choir <laughs> offering we're about to have. Uh, thank you so much for holding your applause after the children sang beautifully at the intro today. And if you'd like to applaud them, you may do so now. Our parents, thank you so much for bringing them so early this morning at 8.30 so that we could fit everything in. Um, I am just so grateful for your time not only for today, for the weekly rehearsals as well. And they did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Thank you, June. Uh, it's, say, on St. John's Day, it's our, this might not be on. On St. John's Day, it's our uh, tradition to do a couple of things that are sort of out of the ordinary in a normal church service, but not on this day. The first is to be on the lookout for uh, anyone with, who's festooned with the largest number of St. John's Day pins. Now, I saw people at the door who confessed to me they'd lost track that it was St. John's Day, and so they didn't bring their pins, which, understandable, it's been very busy. But I have one. I see one many here. I see the McAllister Platts were left in the will by Judge Platt and Bird Platt, their collection of pins, which seems like cheating, but that's a lot of pins. <laughs> I see a tremendous number of pins. Uh, Joan, you have a lot of pins. That, how many do you have there? A lot, though. You might be the winner. Uh, is there, I see five on, over there. I bet it's you. Congratulations for being the winner of our St. John's Day informal button contest. I've been blessed to receive several collections of buttons in the last year or so, but I, you know, I'm not gonna be a McAllister Platt and put on somebody else's buttons, a <laughs> stolen honor, no. Um, and also, it's our habit to, uh, to have a cake, to sing happy birthday, and to invite one of our youngest members and one of our most beloved members, uh, to uh, both to cut the cake. And so this year, uh, Davis Vassander is going to come up with his mom uh, to cut the cake. Davis, you want to come on up? I've got this not very sharp knife. Mr. Peter Kohler is the our one of our most beloved members to come down. All right, and I think, Carol, do we sing first and then cut? I think so. All right, let's sing. Can we sing Happy Birthday? Okay.
here? Yeah. All right. Nice one. That's my size. Yeah. <laughs> because of masks and coronavirus. But there will be spice cake available uh, following the service uh, on the Bluestone patio for, for all of us. Let me move this away and then we'll give our operatory sentence. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to God's name, bring offerings, and come into his courts with praise.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the the blessing of Almighty God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.